The new M1 MacBooks are a big deal. Apple has democratized the access to the power and tools needed to create pretty much anything our heart desires on the internet today with these new chips. In today's video, I wanna talk about the M1 MacBook Air, the base model, eight gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigabytes of storage and why that has been more than enough for me to be a video creator here on YouTube. For the vast majority of creators online, we're working with either 4K footage or 1080 footage and the first thing I want to confirm is that the M1 chip in the air can handle this footage no problem on an editing timeline. I do however want to mention the kind of camera I'm using because the type of footage you're working with can really dictate the kind of experience you're having and for me personally I'm using the Sony a7R 3 and the Sony a6600. In both of these cameras I am shooting in the full resolution of 4k and that's what I've been editing with on the MacBook Air and how it's going to also dictate all of the experience is I'm going to be sharing with you in this video. In terms of video editing software, if you can, I'd recommend that you use Final Cut Pro. I was a Premiere Pro user for years on PC before I bought my very first Mac OS laptop, which happened to actually be the M1 MacBook Air, and I have not regretted switching over to Final Cut Pro. The main reason for me was that I wanted the most optimized video editing experience possible on Apple's new silicon, and the Final Cut Pro program does that for me. It's incredibly fast on this machine, and it's just hard to say when you'd get a rivaled experience like that with programs like Premiere Pro. Who knows how long it'll take for Adobe to really utilize the full power of M1 uh, in these laptops. And on a side note, I do really love the magnetic timeline feature in Final Cut Pro. It makes editing a breeze in comparison to using Premiere Pro and also the export times. They are lightning fast using Final Cut Pro on the M1 chip. And we're gonna talk about more about export times a little bit later in this video. So let's just jump right into the timeline. The first thing I wanna confirm is that you don't need to turn your footage into proxies to be able to edit on the MacBook Air with the M1 chip. You can totally get away with editing footage as is in 4K or 1080p. When I'm editing on the timeline and cutting through footage, the eight gigabytes of RAM has been plenty for me and it's been a relatively smooth experience when I'm not optimizing or turning this footage into proxies. I will say there are occasional hiccups where my MacBook Air will have the beach ball rolling and it's saying that I'm dropping frames or that it's lagging. I do want to pause the video for just a moment and say that if you guys are enjoying this video and you are finding this valuable, please do drop a like and subscribe if you are new here. I have a bunch of new M1 MacBook videos on the way that I know you'll enjoy. But anyways, let's go ahead and get right back into this video. But with that being said, even though I can edit footage as is on my MacBook Air, I still choose not to. I still use proxies for all of my edits and stuff that you see on YouTube. And I know, I hear you. You're saying, what's the point of me even considering buying this M1 chip if a creator like yourself is still using proxy footage? Because my old computer can use proxy footage very well. And I'm gonna kind of argue against that and explain my reasons. The first one being is that we're talking about the M1 chip here. It is incredibly powerful and when I'm turning my footage into proxies, it's not like I'm waiting a long time for that to be done. It, it literally takes anywhere from two to 10 minutes, depending on the amount of footage I'm converting into proxy. Whereas on an old computer where it was necessary to change the videos into proxy before you can even do anything, that conversion process took time. It's not quick anywhere from 10, 20, 30 minutes, depending on how slow your computer is. And the second reason being is that I found that when I've converted my footage into proxies and I have this powerful M1 chip, the result is a lightning fast editing experience. It is the smoothest knife through butter I've ever experienced <laughs> when it came to video editing with proxies. Like I've been using proxies my whole life, but M1 with proxies is like, is like a beast mode of an editing experience. And I know I said you can use this footage unchanged and as is directly at a camera, and you can still do so, and you'll be satisfied with that experience. But for me, I want the fastest editing experience possible, so it's still worth it to me to convert to proxies, even though it's not really necessary. Another reason is more of a legitimate use case. I do have some videos that I make online where I have multiple footage within the same frame, like I'll have my face in it, as well as another 
piece of footage, may it be a screen recording of my MacBook Air. Having this on the editing timeline can be a little bit taxing on the M1 chip. I do experience a little bit of lag there, so that's why I just prefer to use proxies. It just eliminates any kind of lag possible. Again, still totally doable without the conversion, but it's just, it's such a smooth experience. And for a couple of minutes of my time to exchange for lightning quick editing, uh, I'll do that in a heartbeat uh, with this M1 chip in Final Cut Pro. Very quickly, I wanna revisit export times. Exporting on Final Cut Pro with the M1 chip has been incredibly fast. My videos are typically anywhere from five to 20 minutes in length, sometimes 25 minutes. And to export videos of this range has been around anywhere from two to 10 minutes. Like I'm not really waiting a long time uh, for my videos to finish exporting. So that's an awesome benefit to editing with M1 and with Final Cut Pro. And the true benefit of really fast export times is the fact that whenever you need to make changes to your video, if there's anything wrong with it, I can go right back into the project, make the change and re-export the video and it's gonna be incredibly fast. Whereas when I used Premiere Pro, although it was a very smooth editing experience, rendering and exporting times were still, you know, they weren't that fast. It was still quite a long time. So it was a huge burden for me if I had to make a change to the video because I knew that I had to re-export it and I would have to wait like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, depending on the size of the video. And speaking of exporting, a quick tip for Final Cut Pro users is to consider using the background render feature within the application. So if you're not familiar, part of the process of exporting, which is taking that timeline and footage and converting it into a viewable video file that you can share online is rendering. So if we've concluded that rendering is part of the exporting process, why not solve that problem of rendering before you get to the point of when you need to export? And you can, and that's thanks to the background render feature within Final Cut Pro. You just have to go into the system preferences within the app and turn it on. By default, it is set to 0.5 seconds, but I'd recommend you set it to like 30 seconds or a minute. That way, whenever you leave your computer on idle for longer than that period of time, it's gonna start rendering your timeline right away. This is very useful if you have to just quickly answer a phone call or go make some food or go use the washroom, like whatever is distracting you from editing or whatever thing you need to get done that isn't editing, your computer can still stay productive by background rendering in the meantime. And the benefit to all of this is that your export times are gonna reduce drastically because you're still having your computer be productive for you and rendering in the background whenever you're distracted and doing something else. Because let's be honest, we're not sitting at our computer editing 24 hours a day. We do have other priorities in our life, so why not make our computer more useful and more productive when we're away from it by turning on the background render feature. Just a huge tip, been a huge benefit for me in my editing workflow. The next thing I wanna talk about are the recommended accessories you should get on the MacBook Air. I personally am not a fan of using the laptop as is to do video editing. I find there are a lot of limitations to just the physical body of the laptop that I think need to be solved. The first one being is the fact that there's only two USB 4 ports and there's no SD card reader. And as a video creator, we need an SD card slot. So you're gonna have to go on Amazon and find a USB-C dongle or USB-C hub that has an SD card reader built into it. I'll drop a link down below to the one that I use, but there are tons of options out there. Just find the one that fits your budget. I'm also not a fan of editing on a tiny little 13 inch screen. I just find there isn't enough space. So I'd recommend you get an external monitor if you do have the money for it. I personally use a 34 inch ultra wide monitor from LG. This is very expensive and you don't need something like this, but if you can even just get a monitor that's like 20 inches or 24 inches, it's gonna make a huge difference uh, to your editing experience, having all that extra space to see things. It, it, just trust me, editing on that tiny little laptop screen is very tedious and it's going to work against you in the long run. I also recommend getting an external mouse and an external keyboard if you can. I use the Logitech MX Master 3 mouse and the Logitech MX Keys keyboard. I really love this combination. The mouse is very ergonomic in my hand and very comfortable to hold and typing on the keyboard is very comfortable as well. I find that when we're video editing, we're gonna be at the computer for hours on end in a single day. So you wanna protect your health and make sure that you're as comfortable as possible 
so you don't develop any strains in your wrist or in your fingers or hands. So just something to, to be very mindful of. I think it's a worthwhile investment getting a really good uh, keyboard and mouse. Another thing that I'd recommend is that you get an external portable SSD drive to do all of your editing off of. I personally use a Samsung SSD. It's 500 gigabytes and I'll link it in the description down below. I import and edit all of my videos off of this tiny little drive. The real benefit to this is cost. Apple charges a lot of money for you to upgrade the storage from 256 gigabytes to 512 to one terabyte. You're much better off just getting the base model of storage and then going online and finding some type of uh, portable SSD drive that you could use instead for editing videos. From my personal experience, the performance difference is negligible editing internally on the SSD versus editing externally on a portable SSD. Portable SSDs are just incredibly fast these days and it's also thanks to the USB 4 port built into this MacBook Air, data transfer speeds are incredibly fast. So moving on from accessories, the final question I wanna answer in this video is whether or not you should get the eight gigabyte or 16 gigabyte model of RAM for this laptop. I've already answered that for myself. I use eight gigabytes of RAM, it has been plenty for me to get my work done. I typically upload anywhere from one to four times a week and I typically make tech videos as you guys can see so my process isn't too complex and eight gigabytes of RAM has been plenty for me to get the work done. However, if you're somebody who's using more complex footage like 8K files or if you're somebody who wants to have a lot of multitasking where you have a bunch of Chrome and Safari tabs open, you have Photoshop and Lightroom and Final Cut Pro open, then having 16 gigabytes of RAM can make a difference. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching today's video. I hope you guys did enjoy this and found this valuable. Please do drop a like if you did enjoy and subscribe if you are brand new to my channel and comment down below hashtag M1 MacBook Air if you did finish the video. I'll make sure to heart and respond to your comment for you making it all the way to the end. Uh, but anyway, I'll catch all of you guys in a future video later this week. Stay safe and we'll talk soon. Peace.